There you are. You are a beginner on ancient coin collecting and you want to enter the world of Roman coins. You look online for dealers, auctions, and you come across these terms. Roman Imperial coins, Roman Republican coins, and Roman Provincial coins. But it gets worse. Inside Roman Provincial coins, you see Roman Civic coins, Municipal coinage, Provincial coins, Pseudo-Autonomous coins, you think that's just too damn complicated and you close the web browser and you just go back to modern coins, I don't know. Well, don't worry, it's not as complicated as it looks. And this video will teach you what Roman Provincial coins are, what all this terminology is, and hopefully this will make your life a little bit easier when researching a coin you might be interested in. Let's go! Before we delve into the world of what provincial coins are, we need to quickly glance over what they are not. And that is imperial and republican coin issues. Because on most shops, you will see Roman coins divided into three categories. Roman imperial, Roman republican, and finally Roman provincial. Roman republican and Roman imperial means coins issued by the central Roman authority, may it be the Senate, dictators, generals on campaign, or maybe the emperor himself. These coins were minted at mints directly controlled by the central state authority, like this cute little Cistercius I'm showing you here. So just so we can see an example of, the, of a Roman Republican coin, here's a very typical one. A denarius struck at the mint of Rome during the Republican period. It has its value mark, the bust of Roma on the reverse, it has the abbreviation of the magistrate responsible for its issue, all very official and tightly controlled by the central state. These centrally issued coins would have validity as legal tender throughout the Roman territories. Although there are some exceptions in some areas which we will get into later, the, so for example the quintessential imperial coin was the denarius. The fact hordes and stray finds of denarii are found absolutely everywhere where there was Roman activity indicates how widespread the coin was. It was basically used everywhere. If you were a Roman citizen and you went on to, let's say, Hispania, you would have these in your pouch. They were lightweight and a single coin had a respectable value in it, making it a portable way of transporting your purchasing power instead of holding kilos of bronze coins. But just because they're called imperial coins, it doesn't mean they were necessarily minted at the mint of Rome. Here's a lovely example of a denarius minted for Julia Domna, the wife of Septimius Severus. This coin was minted at the eastern area of the empire, yet it is an imperial issue. Why? Because it follows the monetary standard established by the emperor and had all the visual elements of an imperial coin. Legends in Latin, the image of the ruling emperor, in this case empress, and its weight and metal purity are in line with what was established by central authorities for the Roman monetary system. But there is a point we need to consider. We are talking about an absolutely immense empire in a pre-industrial society. It doesn't matter how much the emperor tried to control the economy or most of the activities in the provinces, as much as he possibly could, it simply wasn't feasible to provide consistent coinage to all of the territory. Not only that, we're talking about a multi-ethnic state. And some regions, especially the East, were deeply monetized long before the Romans even started minting coins. This means the Empire had to hand over some autonomy in the minting of coins for local authorities in order for the economy in these places to properly function. The right to mint coins and mints, other than those directly controlled by the state, was tightly controlled. It was a tightly controlled privilege but it was given to many cities, and sometimes entire provinces. All of these coins receive a blanket term, Roman provincial coins, in the numismatic market, but 
we will see it is a bit more complex than that. First, let's discuss what a provincial coin is. As the name suggests, this is a coin meant to circulate in an entire province. What I have on screen now is a Teta Drachma struck in Alexandria, Egypt, under Antoninus Pius. Some people used to consider these coins were meant only to circulate in Alexandria, but it turns out these were meant to be used all over the province of Egypt. What distinguishes a provincial coin from an imperial coin? Well, a provincial coin generally follows the visual formula of an imperial issue, that is, the image of the emperor, his regnal titles, references to his rule, but the provincial authorities had the permission, or sometimes they were forced, to strike pieces of different weights, different metal alloys, and even put and they would even put different languages on their coins. That generally happened in regions where a different monetary system was established long before the Romans arrived. In the case of Egypt, they were using the Greek standard established by the Ptolemies some 300 years before their arrival. It was simply more intelligent to let the region retain their system. This didn't disrupt the dynamics of trade between Rome and the province. The only thing that happened was an overhaul to the visuals of the coin, to be more in line with the message the Romans wanted to pass. In the case of this piece, we have legends in Greek, the language most spoken in the region, and it was mandatory to feature the image of the emperor on the coins as to assert his authority over Egypt. Here's another example of a provincial coin. Now we're going to Syria, a very rich province in Roman times. This is an example of a tetadrachma struck under Emperor Trajan. If we put it side by side with coins that circulated in the region previously, before the Romans, like this tetadrachma struck in the city of Tyre, we will see there are remarkable similarities on both the obverse and the reverse. The older coins of Tyre must have been used as a visual reference for the Romano-Syrian tetadrachma, which very often, for example, depict this, this eagle. Provincial coins weren't always made out of precious metals, you see. In fact, let's check out this tiny little thing here. It's so minuscule. This is a chalcos, the smallest denomination meant to circulate in Roman Syria. As we look at the obverse, we see this lovely bust of Trajan, very tiny. I wonder if they had some sort of magnification lenses to, to see so close and to sculpt something so tiny. How do we know this is a provincial coin and not an imperial coin? As I said, this coin doesn't fit the strict size and weight of imperial coins. The smallest imperial piece of the time was a quadrants, which weighted a good three times what this little thing weighs. And by the location these coins are, fo are found, these pieces are reported all over the province of Syria. It indicates that they were meant to circulate all over the province. We then go to Roman civic coins, sometimes called municipal coinage or colonial coinage. While provincial coins were made to circulate around the entire province, these coins were made to circulate on just a single city and its surrounding areas. The name itself gives us a clue. Civic comes from civitas, city in Latin, and municipal comes from municipium, a name given to towns. The idea is that Small change for everyday transactions was generally in short supply, so cities around the provinces acquired special authorization from the emperor to strike coins for local use. These were almost always in bronze or copper. In fact, I have a hard time thinking about any civic coins struck in precious metals. I believe these were these was this was an exclusive right either to imperial mints or major provincial capitals. If you were from a small city, you could strike your change, your local change, and that was it. Obviously, civic coins have a pretty local visual character. They come in wildly different sizes, weights, designs. They come in Greek as well as Latin, depending on the language spoken at the city. But most of the time, this, there is one rule they must abide to, is to either show the emperor's face or directly mention him. 
after all, he gave you the authorization to mint this coin. The coin also must be specific about which city they were meant to circulate in. So let's look at an example from Spain, from the city of Iulia Traducta. This is an ass, struck under Emperor Augustus. Beyond the western part of the empire, this city decided to just copy the weight standard of the ass struck at the imperial mints. But as we can see, it has its own personal style, different to the one from the Italian mints. Also, notice the legends on the obverse. There is a direct reference to this coin being minted with Augustus' permission. Permissio Caesari Augusto, struck with the permission of Caesar Augustus. The bust is also somewhat more crude in style if compared to the imperial issues, indicating this was sculpted with local artisans. So, as I said, a civic coin specifies directly the city it is from, so people knew its area of circulation. In this case, the reverse has a civic crown, and inside of it, the name of the city, Iulia Traducta. Despite being in Latin and weighting the same as an imperial ass, if you went to Rome with one of such coins, it would be unlikely people would recognize and accept this coin. You might not even have it accepted in other cities in Hispania itself. We aren't 100% sure on this, but it seems like they were indeed meant to be used in very specific local contexts. Despite the coin following imperial standards, and the legal statue of the city was almost like if the city was a Roman miniature inside of Rome's borders. In any case, if you wanted to travel, you were better off exchanging all your bronze, local bronze, for silver denarii. For the sake of practicality, it was lighter and to ensure that your money, your silver, was accepted wherever you went. So how about we look at another example of a civic coin? Let's go to the other side of the empire, at the city of Tiana in Cappadocia, on modern-day Turkey. Completely different part of the empire, completely different design elements in this coin. Although it still follows the formula of mentioning the emperor and the issuing city as requested from civic issues. This coin was struck during the reign of Hadrian. The Greeks generally had much more experience engraving coin dice. And it shows, this coin has really good style compared to the Spanish piece, and Hadrian's head pops out of the flan in really nice relief. I really like this coin. This time, the legends are in Greek. We read, Autokratoros Caesar Adriano Sebastos. The same legends you would find in a contemporary denarius, but in Greek instead of Latin. The region of Cappadocia was used to bronze coins of a different standard to the imperial one. So this coin weights around 7 grams instead of the 11 from the previous ass. So if you ever left Tiana and wanted to go somewhere else in the empire, you were better off exchanging your local bronze coins for our precious metal coins once more. And then once you arrived wherever you were supposed to go, you would get your local bronze change there. Quickly looking at the reverse of this coin, clearly there were no mandatory designs on civic coins. Each local administration picked its own. In the first one, we had the civic crown, but in this case, completely different. We have Athena holding Nike, with her spear and shield close to her. But once more, marking the coin clearly as being meant for local circulation. The legends begin with the word Tianeon, coin from Tiana. There are hundreds of different cities that struck coins during the imperial period, so it's a vast and really diverse part of Roman numismatics that you should explore if you're up for an academic challenge. It's really interesting. We finally get to pseudo-autonomous coins. You might have seen this name at auction catalogs. Sometimes these coins are listed as Greek, which most of the time it's actually right. They were struck in Greek cities, but the name is not intuitive, so let's explore this. What does it mean to be pseudo-something? It means to appear to be something, but in reality, not really be that. As an example, I am a pseudo-intellectual. 
I might sound like I'm an, I'm an intelligent guy, I'm an intellectual, but I'm just a nerd who likes coins. A pseudo-autonomous coin, then, means a coin struck by a city that looks like an independent political entity. It nominally might have been, but factually, it was not. Pseudo-autonomous coins are generally from the late Republican period and the early Imperial period. These were minted by cities either directly administered by the Romans or in regions under Roman rule, but the iconography in these coins does not show any direct signs that the city was under Roman influence, instead looking like they're just coins from some Greek city-state or local league. They often feature gods or goddesses or images meant to be a personification of the city, and the legends make reference either to the city directly, like a municipal coin, or to local magistrates. The best way to exemplify is for us to look at a couple of examples again. Let's start by this cute little bronze from Antioch. This particular coin was struck dur during the time of Emperor Augustus, but back then the city, in fact the entire region, had been part of the empire for just a couple of decades. They were officially a province already, but we can consider this period to be a transitional one, as the province was still being integrated into the empire. As you can see on the obverse, the coin doesn't have any images of the Emperor or Rome or anything related to Rome. Instead, we only have Zeus. Heading to the reverse, we have a ram with a star above it. And the legends read Epi Silano Antiochion from Silenius of Antioch. Silenius was the legate of Emperor Augustus, his legal representative in the city. But as you can see, there are no direct references to the Emperor himself. As a result, this coin looks like it was struck under an independent Antioch by its local magistrate, but in reality, this local magistrate was basically a Roman administrator. Therefore, this coin can be considered a pseudo-autonomous coin. Another example, this little bronze piece from the city of Eumenea in Phrygia. This piece is theorized to have been struck around the time of the Roman Republic, right when the Republic annexed the entire region as the new province of Asia. On the obverse, once more we have the bearded bust of Zeus. Notice what a lovely jet black patina this coin has, likely the result of it being buried in very dry soil. On the reverse, we have no reference to the new Roman overlords, nor anything like that. We have just an oak wreath, and inside, the name of the city, Eumenon. Once more, no references to who actually ruled the city. The coin only provides information about where it was struck. Therefore, it makes it another pseudo-autonomous coin. Finally, one last example. This one is tricky, but it's a good coin to show the distinction between civic coins and pseudo-autonomous coins. That's a piece from the city of Adrianoterai. By the name, we can say this city was founded by Emperor Hadrian. And on the obverse, we can guess this is a bust of Hadrian, right? Well, no. This is a personification of the Roman Senate. And the legends around the bust make reference to the Holy Senate. If this was Hadrian's bust, we could call this coin a civic issue under Hadrian. But since it is not, we can classify it as pseudo-autonomous. Maybe we have a reference to the emperor on the reverse? No. On the, rever on the reverse, we have Asclepius, the god of medicine and patron deity of the city. On the legends, once more, no references to Hadrian, just the name of the city in Greek, Adrianoterai. There are lots of ancient sites in ancient cities where we basically know nothing about this city. Only the coins are like the very last testimonies that these places ever existed. And it's, it's amazing to think that one of the last evidences that an entire city existed is in my hands. So, now you are a slightly better informed numismatist. Roman Imperial and Republican coins are those struck under the direct Roman administration, may it be an emperor or the Roman state, 
Provincial coins are coins intended to circulate around an entire province. Civic issues are coins meant to facilitate trade in a single city. And pseudo-autonomous coins are basically coins that look like they were struck by an independent state, but in reality, they were struck under Roman rule, while retaining their native independent iconography. I hope you enjoyed this quick little class. If you did, make sure to leave a like and consider subscribing. Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.